tonight I'd like to talk about two scary things. Not horror stories, but in one way they are horror stories. Two ideas sort of getting spread around that we as meditators should avoid. first comes from an incident a couple years back. A couple of us were up in Seattle, and there were some people showing us around through the library there, the Cool House Library, and it was pretty cool. Lots of neat little architectural ideas. And toward the end of the tour, the, the woman who was leading the tour, who had had lots of contact with other monks in different branches of the forest tradition, turned to me and said, You're not like other monks. You notice things. I'm not saying that to brag. I'm saying that because it's scary. The people out there are given the idea that it's the duty of a monk not to notice things. It shows to have blinders on your eyes. and cotton stuffed on your ears, that in your restraint of the senses you're supposed to be oblivious to things. And that's not the way things are at all. When you meditate, how are you going to gain any knowledge if you don't notice things? As as you sit here with the breath, it's the same place over and over and over again. And the only difference between sitting here and muddling through and sitting here and getting awakening is that in awakening you notice things that have been here all along. They may be too subtle, or you were looking in the wrong place, or you had the wrong ideas to begin with. But the problem was that something was going on that you weren't noticing. And the whole purpose of the meditation, to get the mind really still, is that you can notice things more clearly. Particularly you can see your own actions, where you're causing unnecessary stress, where you're causing unnecessary harm, and how you can find another way to act so you're not causing that stress or harm. You've got to notice things very carefully. When I first went to stay with the John Fuang, my re return to Thailand to ordain in 1976, one of the things he told me before I ordained was, you're going to have to learn how to think like a thief. Don't expect everything to be explained to you. And I thought about that. How does a thief think? Suppose you were a thief and you were going to rob somebody's house. Would you go to the front door and knock on the door and say, Excuse me, when are you going to be away from home? And by the way, where do you keep your valuables? Thieves don't act that way. They case the joint. They watch it surreptitiously and try to see the things that the owners don't want them to see. In other words, they have to notice. and not simply wait for everything to be told to them. They have to try to figure things out on their own. That's the second scary thing. Recently we got a CD of Dharma talks. And one of the things the teacher in the Dharma talks was saying was that as you meditate, don't try to figure things out, just let go. Well, there, there are two ways of letting go. One is just telling yourself to let go. And when you let go in that way, of course, what happens is as soon as your attention is diverted, you pick things back up again, if that's your old habit. You have to see through the habit. You have to figure out why do you try to hold on to things to begin with. If you understand why you hold on, and you also understand the, the drawbacks of holding on, 
and realize that you have an alternative, then you let go. You don't have to tell yourself to let go. It's automatic. That letting go comes through understanding, and the understanding does come through trying to figure things out. I think I've told you many times before that when I was staying with the John Fuang, I was his attendant. And it's not the case that he told me where things should go, or how things should be folded up, or what should be prepared first, and what should be prepared second. If I did something wrong, he'd let me know. But he wouldn't tell me what the right way to do things was. And he wouldn't reward me when I did them right. He would just accept it as normal. So that meant, again, I had to be observant, also figure things out. If he wanted to take a bath, what were the signs that he was getting ready to take his bath so I'd have things prepared? If he wanted to be let alone, left alone, how could I figure that out without asking him or without him having to tell me to go away? It's little things like that. But you find that when you figure it out on your own, it makes a bigger impression on your mind. You retain it a lot longer than if you're simply told, well, this is the way things have to be. It has to be this way. You do this. Watch for that. You don't remember those lessons nearly as well. This is why I was shocked to hear that someone has written down a book of all the different protocols that monks are supposed to follow, the monasteries in Thailand. So all you have to do is memorize the protocols, and there you are. You know everything you need to know. But you don't really know it, because you don't know why. There's a reason for the protocols. Sometimes you hear it told that, well, this is because a John Munn had a vision that this was the way it should be done. But a John Munn wasn't that sort of person who just believed visions. He would notice it. If you arrange things in this way, or if you didn't arrange things, what was what effect it was going to have on your mind? If you arrange things in a certain way, which was the best way to arrange things? What was the best way to do things? Even simple little things like sweeping out your hut, taking care of your robes. In fact, as as monks, we have so few possessions. It means we can learn how to take care of our possessions very well and use them as object lessons in learning how to be observant, how to figure things out. Notice what's the best way of doing things. We have the rules in the Vinaya to tell us the things that are really wrong and really right to do, but then the fine shades of things. What is the best way to clean out the, the sala? What is the best way to sweep? What's the best way to mop? It's the best way to wipe down a floor. There is a best way. And it's more fun to try to figure it out on your own than it is to simply be told that this, this is how it's done. Make sure you do it like this and behave. That doesn't teach, teach you to observe. It teaches you how to fit in. But then part of you is going to rebel. So why should I fit in? But if you discover for yourself that this is the best way to sweep. It's your discovery. You've exercised your own powers of observation, your ability to pose a question and then figure out how to answer it. Those are the qualities that make all the difference in your meditation. You look at the Buddha's instructions on meditation. He doesn't lay everything out. He gives, basically poses a questions for you. He says, breathe in long, breathe out short. Or breathe, excuse me, learn how to breathe in long, breathe out long, breathe out short, breathe out short. And then it's up to you to decide, well, when is it best to breathe in long and when is it best to breathe out in short? And then he tells you to be aware of the whole body as you breathe in and then to calm the motions of the breath. How do you do that? You experiment. You try different ways of doing things, and you observe for yourself that you like this way of doing it. It helps the mind settle down. Again, part of you, the reason you like learning this way is because it's your discovery. 
And also it's exercised your powers of observation. As I said earlier, the, the place where you're going to find awakening is a place you've been many, many times before. Just focused in the present moment, noticing how the breath changes, how it has an impact on the body, how it has an impact on mind. On the mind, it's the place where the, basically the mind and the body meet. And it's just that at some point there will come the point where you really see something that's been there all along, but you were looking in, from the wrong angle or asking the wrong questions or just simply weren't quiet enough to see what was going on. You were rushing in with your own preconceived notions that this has to be this and that has to be that. When you breathe in, this has to happen. When you breathe out, that has to happen. How about thinking of all the breath channels in your body wide open, and they'll take care of all your breath needs. Just hold that thought in mind and see what happens. In other words, allow a different way of thinking about what's going on here. And you begin to notice the power that your perceptions have on how you experience just the physicality of your body. Something we take for granted is it, it has to be this way because this is the way it is. After all, it's solid. It's matter. But then your experience of matter is filtered through your preconceived notions. So try changing a few of those and see what happens. So you've got to turn things over in your mind. You've got to be observant. Learn this habit in all of your activities, because it's going to be the habit that makes all the difference in your meditation. So that you won't have horror stories being told about the monks from Wadmeta. Don't observe things and don't figure things out. This habit of being observant, of noticing things. That's one of the most important things we've been given by the forest tradition. And the forest monks picked it up from the Buddha himself. The Buddha was a very observant person, after all. How else was he going to gain awakening? And he had to figure things out. How would he have come up with all those teachings if he hadn't tried to figure things out? You look at the story of his life, he ran into several dead ends every now and then. He found that the pursuit of sensual pleasures was a dead end, so he tried to figure out what he could do. It wasn't that he, the answer came blazoned across the sky. After a lot of thinking, you finally realize he's going to have to leave home. Then he left home and then he ran into another other dead ends. He tried all the good teachers at that time. They didn't teach us a teaching that was satisfactory. Another dead end. So he tried to figure out what he might do, and he really pursued self torture for a while. He got his mind in a state of concentration that was based on not allowing himself to breathe. subsisting on very little food, to see what that would do. After six years, six years, think of that, he realized that was a dead end as well. So I had to figure out what, what alternatives are there. He tried the pursuit of pleasure. That didn't work. He tried running away from pleasure. That didn't work. And he finally realized, oh. He remembered when, as a child, he'd been able to enter the first jhana state where the mind was thinking about and evaluating its object with a sense of ease and rapture. Could this be the way? He realized, yes, this could be the way. But it was a way that he'd, he had never heard anybody explore before. But basically, he was going to learn how to use that sense of pleasure and rapture. Instead of just pursuing it, put it to use. To 
put the mind in a state where it could observe even more carefully. What's the cause of suffering? Where is it found? What can we do to put an end to it? What is the end of suffering like? The potentials were all there in the present moment. Simply he hadn't been in the right space and hadn't had the right supporting factors in mind to really observe what was happening. And if he hadn't been observing, he probably wouldn't have realized the limitations of his teachers, might not even have realized the limitations of a life of the pursuit of pleasure. It was because the observant, he, he was observant that he realized that he hit some dead ends. It was because he was willing to try to figure things out. That was why he was able to find other paths. So finally, the combination of those two qualities brought him to the right spot where he could see things clearly for what they were, how they'd come to be and how he could let them go in a way that could, came from understanding. So always keep this in mind. You want to notice things and you want to figure things out. That's what the meditation is all about.